two slides and one of the slides was of course this complicated phonon dispersion experimentally obtained and the other slide was the Bose-Einstein condensation, right. So, in this lecture we will at least hope to uh, understand how this Bose-Einstein condensation happens, ok. That is the aim. Uh, but before that I will do some more straightforward things uh, uh, which are just very easy generalizations of this phonon analysis we did, ok, just to complete the uh, story there. But uh, before all that I mean of course, if there are any questions I will be happy to take those before I begin. Okay, so if not, then uh, we'll move on. So uh, we'll move on, and uh, uh, the first thing that I would uh, uh, like to do uh, is a very simple generalization from the phonon calculation that we already did. So from phonons at thermal equilibrium at a temperature T, we'll very quickly generalize to photons at thermal equilibrium at a temperature T, ok. Uh, so, we will just very quickly see that and so, if we have photons which are at thermal equilibrium at a temperature T, do you know there is a standard term for that, do you know what that is? I mean what? No, 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 for the photon gas is also at thermal equilibrium at temperature T then it is called something else, there is some more standard term. It is a particular kind of a thing, right. It is called black body radiation, right, <laughs> ok. See, that is why I am saying evening lectures are always challenging, right, <laughs> ok. Black body radiation. No, that could be because somehow, I mean this is what I have seen, uh -huh. that black body radiation is something that exists in uh, thermodynamic school. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Really? <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, I see, I see. Oh, that's very interesting. I thought, oh, but I thought black body radiation is exactly a photon gas at thermal equilibrium. <laughs> right, right. I see. Ok, ok, good. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And of course, you know, this is very important because uh, I guess most of you are aware that uh, even if you look around in the universe, uh, all around us there is this uh, black body radiation at a certain temperature. Yeah, what is the name? Right, exactly, right. So, of course, uh, it is a very important thing, right. Uh, so, so, basically how do you get black body radiation? I mean, it is very simple, you just start with anything, you make a cavity inside that thing and you just heat it up, right you heat it up and you wait for some time and uh, of course, the walls of the cavity can emit photons, they can absorb photons and complicated things happen, but ultimately due to all the nice properties of stationary states, the system comes to equilibrium, right. Most systems come to equilibrium and this will also come to equilibrium and when it comes to equilibrium, then the entire uh, frequency distribution of the photon gas is just determined by the temperature because there is no other parameter here. Right. So, of course, I won't do the quantum field theory of it, and will very will explain things very loosely. So, photons are also can be thought of as bunch of harmonic oscillators, right? And here, uh, it's particularly nice that uh, we really know the dispersion. We think we really know the dispersion, unlike phonons, where it can be some very complicated thing. Here, the dispersion is this and uh, this is really the velocity of light, right, ok. So, one part is very easy here, we know the dispersion for photons, good. There is another part which is also very easy, so I am just trying to point out the differences to the uh, phonon gas situation and then we will do the exact calculation and it will take us very little time to do it, ok. So, this is property 1 that uh, photons also have, ok. Property 2 which is uh, different between phonons and photons is the following. Remember for phonons, when we were talking of phonons, uh, we said that if there are n unit cells, then basically we said that the number of modes is like 3 times n, at least for simple uh, systems, right. What do you think the corresponding number would be for photons? 
Right. Correct, correct. So, in phonons, we of course saw that there are also longitudinal modes which are possible, but for photons, of course, if you just look at Maxwell's equations, we know that that is impossible, right. So, there are only sort of uh, uh, two independent modes possible. So, if you create a plane wave, basically the E and the B both are perpendicular to the uh, direction of motion of the wave, okay. So, that is second. What is the third difference? The third difference is for phonons, we saw that there was a notion of a Brillouin zone. Even when we were doing uh, this uh, Debye theory, uh, essentially we had to impose an omega max because we wanted to get the correct number of modes, right. Now, and that is what helped us to basically define the limits of integration over k and omega. So, what do you think is the corresponding thing for photons? What should I do? What is the analog of a Brillouin zone? for a photon gas. Hmm? Why? Yeah, that is correct. So, I mean uh, for the phonon gas, you see there was a displacement field, right, which was uh, living at specific uh, coordinates and those coordinates were defined by the equilibrium position of the crystals, right. And that is what led to the concept of uh, uh, Brillouin zone, right. We saw that, right. Now, here, uh, I mean, here suppose you want to write a wave equation, let us say just in E, so something like this, right. Of course, there is no constraint over this coordinate, right. So, clearly there is no notion of a Brillouin zone in that sense because another way to think of it is this A here tends to 0, right. So, these are some of the differences uh, compared to the uh, uh, phonon gas, right, good. So, I would just like to sort of uh, highlight these differences and then we will quickly just do the calculation, right, because uh, then everything is straightforward, right. So, basically, let us say we have a phonon gas and now let us say we have a photon gas, right. So, we discuss these differences, I will just sort of jot them down here, that is it. Um, so, of course, uh, one difference is in the number of normal modes, right. So, usually uh, for a uh, phonon gas, there are uh, three modes per unit cell, right, per unit cell or if the unit cell has more complicated structure with a point basis, there is three times new modes per unit cell. And uh, then of course, uh, uh, what we saw is that there is some complicated dispersion relation that we have to microscopically calculate, right, for each system of crystal, right for one given crystal and for another completely different geometry of a crystal, these things will be different, right. That is what we saw. Of course, the low k part, the part which is close to k equal to 0 is always linear, at least the acoustic branch, but otherwise the structure can be very complicated, right. But for a photon gas is of course, very system, uh, very simple. There are only two sort of uh, possible modes at each k because we only have transverse polarizations allowed here and we do not even need to calculate that case by case because this is fixed, right. This is just this, right. So, this is actually easier than this case, okay, if you think about it, good. So, then comes if you wish restriction over k, k. Here, there was the restriction over a Brillouin zone, okay. So, in 1D that was defined from minus pi by A to pi by A in high dimensions, you can generalize it. But here, basically k is arbitrary, right, as we just discussed. And uh, yeah, these are essentially the differences and basically then we will just need to use these two things and we can just calculate everything. Good. So, this is actually a simpler problem. That is why I left this problem for the afternoon session because this is actually much simpler in some sense than this problem, right. So, good. 
Okay, so far so good. So now, let us do this calculation for the uh, energy of the system. Again, you know, I'll not explicitly write the zero point energy. I'll just write, so in an oscillator as we already have seen several times, the energy is of this form, right? So, I'll not write this part, okay? I'll just write this part and derive things like specific heat and uh, internal energy and so on and so forth. But one question, can somebody tell me what is the specific heat of this system at low temperature? How should it go at low temperature for a black body radiation? Correct, absolutely, right. How should it go at high temperature? Correct. <laughs> See, this is very peculiar, right? Because uh, here your Brillouin zone ultimately made the specific heat do this, but here it just keeps going, right? I mean, uh, omega is like k, so it's a linear thing. I mean, no matter how much you fill it up, you will always get the same answer. So, this is really a much simpler case, right? So, okay, good. So, we'll just quickly do those calculations, okay? And then we'll move to something else which is basically trying to understand this uh, BEC, which will take us slightly more work uh, after I explain some points about this thing. Okay. So, let us calculate U. So, I will not do many steps, I will just skip them because uh, in some way or the other we have done those steps for the other problems. So, of course, again it is a bunch of oscillators. So, we will have something like this and I am ignoring this zero point energy. Okay. So, then because it has two polarizations, I will just use that fact. Good. So far, so good. Right. And of course, I can easily convert from omega to k using this relation. So, let us just do that. And this 2 comes because there are 2 polarizations. So, now I convert this momentum sum to a momentum integral. Again, using the same box normalization and so on and so forth. So, let me just do that. So, let us just quickly see what we get. This is what I get. Okay. So, good. So, then it can be written in a nice form like this. So, energy uh, normalized by the volume of the box that can be written in a nice form like this. So, let me just write it. Um, so, let me define this function. Let me define this function u. So, this function u is the following. this is the function q. Okay? And I integrate over d omega and from 0 to infinity. right? And uh, yeah. Okay. Now, can somebody tell me, so this u by v just depends on temperature, right? when I finish this integration. right? So, just by looking at the structure of this integrand, of course, it is a bit more complicated to do the actual integral. But just by looking at the structure of this integrand, what do you think is the answer? What is the variation in t? Of course, uh, you can easily guess what it is from the specific heat, but do not do that. I mean, look at this integrand and. Uh, uh, sorry? What? What? 0 to infinity. Uh, so, the reason is 0 to infinity is, as I said, there is no Brillouin zone here, right? Oh, no, no, this is 0. Sorry, this is 0, 0. Okay, so, let us look at this integrand and can anybody guess uh, what it tells us uh, about the variation of this integral as a function of t? Just look at this. I 
I mean, okay, the hint is that you can just use dimensional analysis. Yeah, just use dimensional analysis. So, you see, I mean, omega, so ignore h bar, right? Omega has the dimension of inverse beta or omega has the dimension of t, right? Sorry, omega is like t because it is like inverse beta. Anyway, uh, so this object is dimensionless. This object has a certain dimension and you are doing an integral and I have given you so many hints. I mean, t power 4, right? Because do you understand this logic? I mean, this is a logic which you should realize when you look at in integrals like this, right? Because I mean, to solve it exactly may need some work, but you can just guess the answer, right? This is dimensionless, clear? This is dimensionless, right? There is a 1 here and there is a e to the something here. This has to be dimensionless. So, the dimension of omega is inverse beta, which is like t. So, the dimensionful quantity here is omega q and you are doing an integral over omega uh, d omega. So, that is like omega to the 4, right? So, that is like t to the power 4, right? So, the answer must go as t to the power 4 without doing any integration. Now, if I do this integration, which again, thankfully, Kirsten Huang did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Correct. So, beta cube and then 1 beta there. Mm -hmm. So, I have to divide out by 1 by beta to the power. Which is r basically the same argument. Yeah. 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 So, you try to make everything inside dimensionless. You try to make everything inside dimensionless and then you anyway pull out the dimension outside. That is another way of doing it. Okay. So, then once I do this integral, I get the following answer. Pi square by 15 k b t to the power 4. So, this is 4 and uh, h cut c by q. Okay, this is the answer and then of course, uh, from here I can even get the specific heat right? and I just differentiate this with temperature and then I get So, that is T cube. There are some universal constants here. That is very nice, right? Uh, sorry. I am ah, okay. Okay. I hope you can clearly see this. You see, look. So, the specific heat goes as T cube, but the coefficient A here is universal, right? I mean, as it has to be because everything about the photon is a universal thing, right? So, yeah. So, yeah. So, that is the answer, right? So, no matter what kind of cavity do you heat, if you heat a copper cavity or a gold cavity, do not try to heat a gold cavity or a some other cheap metal cavity, uh, bronze cavity. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, of course, the copper is very different from bronze, right? So, the intrinsic oscillations of the atoms near the wall of the cavity, of course, microscopically are doing different things because one thing is copper and the other thing is bronze. But look at the remarkable thing. I mean, see, this calculation looks very obvious, right? But look at the remarkable thing. When the photon gas inside comes at equilibrium at a temperature T, everything becomes independent of whether you started with a copper cavity or a bronze cavity. This is the answer. Right? I mean, sometimes we take everything uh, for granted, but it is good to just stop and think for a while. right? So, the fact that the thing is at equilibrium is a very powerful and in also in some sense a very restrictive statement. Right? So, it restricts a lot of things and just gives you the answer. Okay? So, this is the answer. And how is this answer different from the phonon case? Of course, at low temperature, as many of you correctly guessed, this should go as T cube because there is no difference between this and this at low energies. This is also linear in k and this is also linear in k. So, there is no surprise. However, for the phonons, we saw that the specific heat sort of saturated to some constant, whereas here it keeps on increasing, it keeps on diverging, right? I mean, 
as t tends to infinity specific heat also tends to infinity and that is simply because there is an infinite number of modes here which you can excite that's it right so this is done so good so now i'll show one more thing about this photon gas or also equivalently for the phonon gas which is now we try to study the number fluctuations of either the photon gas or the phonon gas. I will do it in such a language that it can be applied both here or here. And then we will realize that even if the number of either photons or phonons, now you can use the words interchangeably, even if the number of these particles is very large in some mode, you will see that the number fluctuation is still uh, does not go to zero. I mean, uh, this is quite relevant to what I am going to do next. So, uh, yeah, you had a question. I also don't remember, but <laughs> please calculate. <laughs> yes. Correct. Oh. Yeah. Th yeah, but that depends precisely on this coefficient. Yeah, that's correct. Because of course, T uh, cube uh, specific heat other things but the advantage of this thing is it's always t cube independent of where you are in temperature for most of the materials there are always corrections here there is no correction that's it this is the story so this is one of those very nice uh, exactly some universal constant yeah correct large yeah 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 Oh, yeah, 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 I mean, uh, yeah, that we can, yeah, yeah, that we can just point out from here, that, yeah, see, that we can just point out from here. So, what Shamik is saying is, I mean, yeah, thanks. So, see, I mean, see, what is this thing? This thing is nothing but, if you look in the box again, and you sort of literally imagine your head as, as to what is sort of the energy density between frequency omega and omega plus d omega and then omega 2 and omega 2 plus d omega and you draw that probability distribution. This is exactly that probability distribution, right? And this of course does not look like a Maxwell distribution, right? So this distribution is called the uh, Stefan Boltzmann distribution, right? And this is also universal. Plan equation. Plan equation. Oh, sorry. Oh, whatever, somebody's distribution, but this is uh, what the photon gas does. Correct, correct. One of the things which led to the birth. Yeah, one of the things, yeah, not not the only thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, one of the things which led to this. So, yeah, it, there's an interesting history to it actually. So, you know, when people looked at specific heat and T cube and T to the 4 here, they had ways of explaining even through some concocted classical mechanisms both T cube and T to the 4. They had some ways of explaining it. In hindsight, we can say, oh, yeah, they were all concorded things. But of course, at that time, nobody knew quantum mechanics, right? But the thing that really puzzled everybody was this. Yeah, so. And of course, this was not the only thing which triggered quantum. Yeah. yeah. But this was one of the uh, big surprises. Yeah, it's the same thing. I mean, there is a system. It has a certain internal energy, right? You heat up the system a bit more, its internal energy increases. You take the difference of the internal energies and dif divide by temperature. It's a gas. It's a gas of photons. Mm. Sorry? But the photon gas has an energy, right? You see, it has a well-defined energy. So, yeah. To heat it up, to heat it up. So, sorry? What do you mean mass? I mean, you see, I mean, look, th this has a, no, I mean, even massless particles can carry energy. I mean, I won't go into relativity and quantum field theory, but this is the statement. This, this is the characterization of the, here. You see, I mean, yeah, just because, oh. I 
I mean, that is generally true. I think that's not his question. What you said is generally true. It's true for any system. Yeah, it was specifically that. No, no, but, but okay. I think his confusion was a photon is a massless oh, particle and how on, yeah. Way, you know. But the energy of the photon is not half mb square. That's your so short answer. Yeah. Because it is defined as the energy density required to increase the temperature by one, one unit. A photon. No, no, but that's what I'm trying to say. The confusion is that the energy is not half mb square. That's all. That's the answer to the question. Straight. Okay, good. No, no, it's not matter gas. It's a gas of photons. There's actually vacuum in the cavity. And the photons are the things which are living. It's not that there is some uh, physical gas living inside. Yeah, of the cavity. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's some cavity. There's nothing inside the cavity. So, this is the thing, right? You just cut out a cavity in some thing. You just heat it up. Keep it at some temperature T. You're absolutely correct. I mean, the walls of the cavity, they can emit and absorb photons. And they are doing these complicated processes. And after you wait a certain time, there is, of course, a photon gas at equilibrium, right? And we are at temperature T. And we are studying the properties of that gas. That's it. Correct. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, for photons also, we can see it. But of course, that's a bit involved. You have to then do uh, quantum field theory. And you have to see the commutation relation of E and B. OK, actually, it's E and A. But whatever. I mean, then you'll see that uh, the photons are also they have bosonic uh, statistics. Sir, one thing I did not understand clearly is you were always uh, <coughs> not including that half. Uh, Which half? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, I'm not including it because if I include it, I have to write an embarrassing expression, which is this. That's why I'm not including it. <laughs> I mean, see, it's half for all the modes, and there's an infinite number of modes, and this is your answer. But I'm not too troubled by it. Because the things which are relevant for us are energy differences. And this thing basically stays the same no matter what your temperature is. So I can just measure everything relative to this. No, no. No, no. I mean, but when you measure something, you can only measure energy differences. How do you measure an absolute energy? Hmm. Correct. Yeah, there are multiple ways of looking at it. One thing is, as I said, I mean, this is just like a shift, right? Uh, so if you calculate anything like a specific heat and all, this doesn't bother us. Secondly, I mean, in principle, if you want, you can write it. But uh, I don't know how to write it in any simple manner. So I just don't write it. But I mean, uh, th there's a good reason I don't write it, right? Because uh, I mean, I really don't observe it as well. Sir, actually, I had an understanding that, uh, this is my understanding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the particle in the cavity mm -hmm. is written as classical particle, oscillator. Which particle? Uh, you mean at the walls? Uh, uh, yeah. You mean at the walls? Yeah. There's nothing. Yeah. You mean in the walls? Yeah. There's no air here. Let's say I've sucked out the air. There's perfect vacuum here. And then I heat it up. Well, in principle, you can also put uh, something else here, and it'll also come at equilibrium. It won't change much. But let's say I suck out everything, and it's really vacuum, and then it's only photons. But then, of course, you're correct. The emission and absorption of the photons have to start somewhere, and they start from the walls. Yeah, this is the which was, uh, correct. Where in the, uh, introduced the concept of absorption and emission. Correct. Matter. Correct. V meaning, uh, okay, you understand. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, the, the energy, infrared energy is absorbed uh, in the form of quanta. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is released in the form of quanta. It's not okay. continuous. Quanta. Of course, of course. Quanta yes, quanta yes, yes. Right. Okay. Okay, fine. Yeah. 
Yeah. By atom. No, but that is fine. That is fine. Yeah. No, no, there is matter at the boundary. Here. I didn't understand that. So, moles are matter? Here, here, here. What if, there is some medium which is, uh, which has atoms which act as emitters or absorptors. Other, other walls here, right? But here there can be vacuum. I mean, there is no problem. There is no problem. I mean, there is a source and a sink here and ultimately uh, through various processes, uh, this part will come into equilibrium with that part. And when it happens, then I get this. I hope this is clear. I mean, uh, yeah, okay. Good. So now uh, let me quickly address the number fluctuations of uh, these kinds of uh, quote unquote particles. So, why am I doing this? So, the reason I am doing this is this is something which I am sure Shamik has already introduced. You see, first you might have started with something called a micro canonical ensemble, right? And then you went to a canonical ensemble, right? And then you must have also gone to a grand canonical ensemble and then there are other ensembles as well. Now, you can ask yourself very reasonably that why do I want to go from a micro canonical to a canonical canonical to a grand canonical, okay? Now, of course, uh, one reason is very physical. I mean, sometimes you are realistically in a situation where let's say there is a system and it's interacting with the environment and energy is being exchanged then a canonical description is more reasonable than a micro canonical description. That is a perfectly good answer. But there is another answer to it, this which is uh, uh, mathematically very precise which is the following. Suppose you even take the classical uh, problem uh, sorry classical mechanics problem of an ideal gas. Okay? Then you try to do the calculation using micro canonical ensemble and try to do the calculation using canonical ensemble. Of course, in both descriptions when the number of particles is large and you calculate things like specific heat and all, you get the same results. But you will clearly see yourself that the calculation with the canonical ensemble is actually much easier even for such a simple system as an ideal gas in classical mechanics. Okay, and uh, simply put that is because uh, uh, one way of thinking about it is in a <coughs> micro canonical ensemble, what is your sort of uh, definition of the ensemble? Your definition is that uh, there is some phase space, some complicated phase space, I am just drawing 2D because it is hard to draw anything more and then maybe you are restricting in some energy window E to E plus delta and this delta is much, much smaller than this E and then the micro canonical ensemble means that whatever the micro states inside are, you just sum over them freely, right? So basically the P of C, this is some term you have repeatedly seen. This P of C is 1 divided by the number of micro states inside this window, okay? Whatever the number of micro states is here inside this window and is 0 otherwise. That is the thing, right? That is the definition of the micro canonical thing. But you see, I mean of course, uh, then when you try to calculate the partition function or anything else, you have to, if when you do your integrations, right, over the phase space variables, you have to constantly worry about this constraint. You have to always move in this energy shell and you have to impose this constraint. For an ideal gas, you can still do it. But let us say you have a more complicated situation where the atoms of the gas are interacting in classical mechanics. You should try at your home to try to even set up this problem. It is quite challenging. Okay? Now you go to the canonical picture. In the canonical picture, what you do is you completely remove this restriction. Now you actually sum over your entire available phase space. Right? But the difference is that you do it with this probability. And how is the connection between this and this made? So, of course, here you can choose, uh, okay, if you choose a certain beta, you can calculate a certain expectation value of energy, right? Okay, uh, at that beta. So, the way you fix the beta here so that everything corresponds to here is whatever is, so let me call that E bar just to distinguish it from this E, you choose beta such that this is true. 
we choose beta such that this is true. And this equation defines the beta uniquely. And once the beta is defined, everything is defined. But then you can still ask me a question. You can ask me a question that if you draw a probability distribution of this E bar here, here it's a delta function. Because all the states can just have, all the microstates that have non-zero probability of occurrence just has the energy E bar here in the microcanonical ensemble. Here, of course, it's not really a delta function. There is some probability distribution, right? It's, of course, peaked at this E bar by construction because I've chosen my beta like that. But then there is a certain uh, distribution here. Then you can ask, oh, why is this situation still the same as this? Well, here central limit theorem kinds of arguments save you. And what one can show on very general grounds, but sometimes these arguments fail, especially near critical points. But otherwise, you can show on very general grounds. Otherwise, that uh, so we have been talking of these critical points a lot. So tomorrow, I'll try to say some things about it. <laughs> but OK. If there are no critical points, then what I'm saying is true. Okay. Uh, then you can show that if you calculate the energy per site, so you can instead plot this guy, right? Then you can show that the width of this distribution actually shrinks as 1 by square root n from central limit theorem kinds of arguments. In fact, yeah, so this is exactly how it uh, scales like. So when n becomes very large, when n becomes very large, uh, if you're looking at energy density or specific heat per site or things like that, intensive quantities, right? Because after all, in thermodynamics, typically what you measure are intensive quantities. Then the intensive quantities in this description are identical to this description. That's the nice thing. But this description is much easier. Why is it much easier? Because you have removed the restriction over this energy window. So you can just do a free sum or a free integral. I hope you roughly see why it's mathematically much easier. This is the real reason, right? So now, when I talk about Bose-Einstein condensation, which I'll talk soon, I hope, I will be in a system where the number of bosons is also conserved, right? Because remember I showed you this rubidium experiment? Well, in the experimental setup, there were some number of experiments, maybe, uh, atoms, right? Maybe 10 to the power 5 atoms, 10 to the power 4 atoms, whatever. But it was a fixed number. See, what is the difference of that system to these two systems? Here, the number of bosons can freely fluctuate. Okay? The number of bosons can freely fluctuate. There's no notion of a well-defined uh, number in that sense. I mean, I can create an arbitrary number of photons, phonons, whatever, whatever, right? And, uh, but for a Bose-Einstein condensation, the number is also strictly defined, the total number of bosons, right? So that's the difference between those kinds of systems and what I'm going to do next. So in the thing that I'm going to do next, I'll introduce a further ensemble, which you must have seen, which is called the grand canonical ensemble. Here, this rule is slightly changed, but again, what I'm going to write is completely general. So this just becomes this. So here, the number is also a fluctuating parameter. Okay? And of course, again, you have some, let's say I use curly E to denote this new partition function. This is just the normalization of this. So now when you sum up over configurations, basically what you're doing is uh, you're summing over all the number sectors as well. And basically this mu would again give you some physics like this. Uh, if you see the number density, uh, you will again see curves like this. And again, if you look at quantities per site and things like that, uh, the grand canonical ensemble would give you the same answer as a canonical ensemble. right? So this is the mathematical trick that we are going to use to understand the BEC. Because this will make our life much simpler. We could have done the problem in a canonical ensemble. It's just going to be more tedious algebra. That's why we'll completely avoid it. So that's the mathematical reason we'll do this, OK? But uh, the steps are precise. I mean, these uh, descriptions are all equivalent to each other. OK? Good. But before I go there, I would like to show you how the number fluctuations look. I mean, just replace this by number. How the number fluctuations look for these kinds of systems, right? So what happened in this system? In this system, when the number of degrees of freedom grew, 
then the fluctuations of the energy per site really started decreasing, right? For these two systems, I'll just now show you that that will not happen. That's why I'm saying that there's no notion of a well-defined number for those systems. But let's just mathematically see it. Okay, it's quite straightforward. Good. Any questions so far? Okay. Good. So I'll just show that. So let me erase all this and then I'll show that. But if you're still not convinced about why it's so much easier to mathematically think about this versus this, I really suggest you to calculate specific heat of a classical gas using this definition and this definition. Then you will see how many steps of algebra you need here and here. I mean, just do that. Yeah, so mathematically, what does that mean? That means that you're doing some multidimensional integral and you have to impose the right delta functions. You see, so you see roughly what's happening. Mathematically, that's more difficult. Doing a constrained integral on some high dimensional space is much more difficult than doing a free integral. I mean, that's intuitively clear, right? So. So let's consider number fluctuations. Oh, by the way, sometimes I use this symbol. This symbol is actually a reasonably accepted symbol for number. This symbol means number. This symbol. Yeah, I mean, it's reasonably ex accepted. In seminars, I can write this and get away with it. So. Must be universally, yeah, yeah. Good, so we are looking at those kind of free systems, right? So, and they are non-interacting sort of bosons, right? So then how does the partition function look? Now I'll just uh, write it in a language that you can apply it for both this or that, right? I mean, yeah. So then, because they are sort of non-interacting, I can write it like this, right? So, if you wish to make a correspondence, E1 is like H cut omega 1, E2 is like H cut omega 2 and so on and so forth, right? But this is the general thing. And of course, all these variables N1, N2, Nj, let's write the J term. All these variables have to be summed from 0, 1 till infinity, right? So far so good because these are bosonic systems, right? So, we can do that very easily. How? I mean, this is non-interacting. So, we can just break uh, this exponential into individual exponentials and then carry out the sum in each individual thing. And then that's just the product of uh, all those uh, 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 exponentials, right? Okay. So, that's exactly what I do. 0 to infinity. Right? So far, so good. And then I just do this thing. This is not hard to do. And I get this. Okay, I just need a bigger yellow chalk here. Okay. So now I can ask the simple question that what is the occupation of the uh, jth uh, uh, state, right? Whose energy is Ej for one quanta? 2ej for 2 quanta and so on. Okay, So, I just asked that question. So, occupation nj, right. So, then again uh, that is very straightforward. All I need to do is insert an nj here, right. And then of course, the rest of it is the same, exactly like this. And then uh, uh, this is, uh, I have to of course, normalize by the partition function. Right? So, this is the definition of n of j. Right? So, this uh, I leave you to verify. You can easily do this that this is just this can be related to the log of z in the following way. This I leave as an exercise. Please do this if it is not immediately clear. I am claiming that this guy is precisely equal to this guy. So, this is derivative, okay? partial derivative. 
So, this guy is equal to this guy. And now, of course, we know log of z. We can just use this, use this. Then, of course, instead of multiplication over j, when I take a log, it becomes a sum over j. And I can easily uh, do everything. So, let us say I do this. So, then I get this expression. Not surprising at all, right? That is what I should get and that is exactly what I got there. So, not surprising. Good. So, now what is the next thing that we want to calculate? We want to calculate number fluctuation. Good. So, what is the definition of number fluctuation in some level j? So, this means average. Uh, so, basically I need to calculate n j square minus n j whole square. right? Everybody is convinced this is the definition of fluctuation. right? So, now I have to calculate this quantity. So, the only thing I need to do is I already know this. right? I already know this. I need to compute this guy. right? Good. Okay. Now, I will just erase that part. Hopefully, all of you know uh, what is there. So, I will erase that part and I will calculate that fluctuation. So, then let us do the steps. Okay. This thing is of course, again by definition n j square e to the minus beta that giant thing right? n 1 e 1 plus dot 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 right? divided by of course, the partition function again. right? Now, we used a trick to get expectation n j. We differentiated once with this kind of a thing. right? So, now here what we do is we will differentiate twice and then we will pull out these factors. So, just writing it clearly and again if this is not immediately obvious when you go back just think about it. It is uh, very simple. So, now I will just do this step twice to pull out two powers of uh, n j downstairs. Yeah? And then this guy itself, but now just the partition function. Uh, this guy, right? Uh, yeah. This, this is my numerator and the denominator is this. So, when you differentiate once with this, wherever there is the term uh, n j e j, right? You can automatically see that when you differentiate this once, that pulls out 1 n j, right? And then we, when you do the differentiation again, that pulls out another n j, right? So, that is exactly this numerator that you want, right? So, that is the trick, okay? Good. So, good. So, then this is of course, exactly equal to this guy. This is exactly equal to this guy. Okay. Very good. Okay. Now, this guy can be manipulated a bit, so that we can get our answer easily. So, now we will just slightly manipulate this. Okay. So, let us do that. So, I am still here. right? So, let us do the manipulation. So, this is the thing. Now, I will write it in another form, which is exactly equal to this. Okay? So, just to, yeah, so let me write this z to be a bit smaller, so that, yeah. So, So, this is what I do. Okay? Now, if you just uh, open this bracket out and do everything, uh, you should be able to see that this is exactly the same as that. Okay? Right. Because when you do this differentiation, you will get one sum with a, uh, one term with a plus sign and there will be another term with a minus sign and that will cancel something else and then you will be back to that. Okay. Good. 
Now, what is the advantage of writing it like this? Uh, look at the second term. What is this, uh, by the way, the second term? Sorry, what? Average square, right, that is correct, with some beta supplemented somewhere, right. Because, uh, see, this guy is just 1 divided by z log of z, uh, sorry, 1 by z del of z del beta e j, right. So, that is exactly the structure, right, but come, it comes twice, right. So, that is like the n square piece and I can just take it here and whatever is left is the fluctuation, right. So, it is a convenient thing to do. Good. So, yeah, so let me just write it out in completeness. Okay, this is I can write it as log of z. This and this guy is beta square mm, nj whole square, right. Okay, good. So, then what we get is uh, ultimately doing all this what we get is, so I will just write down the answer now for the fluctuation there, because now I can take it to the other side and all that stuff. So, this is 1 by beta del n j, uh, sorry expectation n j Ej. This is the answer that you get. But now this is very nice because I already know what is expectation Nj, right? I know it from there, uh, there, right? So I just differentiate it with respect to beta, and I'm done because I already know how that looks like. So I do that. So let's do that. And I write whatever I get in a nice form, in an eliminate form. So, that is like this. So, you can easily verify that uh, when you differentiate this uh, that n, you can write the final answer in this form. You can verify that uh, yourself. So, you can cast the answer like this. Okay? So, now how do you characterize the relative fluctuation? You have to divide this by n j whole square, right? so that it is dimensionally correct. Right, so then I do that. So one NJ, of course, cancels from here, and uh, then it's uh, one by NJ uh, plus one. Now this is the final answer, right? Now, please look at this answer. So, this is the relative fluctuation of the number. Now, suppose uh, n j becomes very large. Do you think this fluctuation will go to 0? Yeah, because there is a 1 sitting. It can never be below 1. So, that is it. This is the proof. I mean, the fluctuations never go down here uh, in the sense the of the energy fluctuations I was talking there, right. So, this is the proof. So, for these kinds of systems, the number fluctuates wildly, right and this is the proof. Okay, good. Everybody is satisfied? Good. So, these systems are very different from a bunch of bosons with an explicitly well defined number capital N. That is what I wanted to drive home. That is very important and this just comes out like this. Good? Good. So, to get a Bose-Einstein condensate, we cannot use these kind of systems. We have to use systems where there is a well-defined number of bosons. So, that is what we will do now. We do not need to put interactions. Uh, uh, we do not need to put interactions, but we need to put the constraint that this is a system where there is a well-defined number of bosons. Okay. Good. Okay. So, now I will go to Okay, very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why probably they don't use it. <laughs> yes. There's some static, but anyway. Okay, so this is good, right? Now in the remaining time, I'll start the 
uh, Bose-Einstein condensation thing and we will see how far we will go in the next half an hour. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, hopefully we will cover quite a bit. There are some steps which are a bit technically involved, uh, technically meaning mathematically, nothing, I will explain the main physics and then it will become clear. But there are some algebra which I will probably not do. If anybody is confused, I can try to do it uh, later. Okay, so. Oh, okay, very good. <laughs> okay, okay, good. That's correct, but see, I'm making the reverse statement. Suppose NJ is very large then still the fluctuations do not go to 0, the fluctuations in the number, right? They, they go to 1. So, I mean, there is no way you can define an average uh, properly here because the variance is as large as the average. That is all I am trying to say. In most systems, including the system we will do, what happens is if the number becomes large, the fluctuations start decreasing as 1 by square root of the number. But in these kinds of systems, this does not happen. That is all I am saying. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Yeah, correct. No, no, no. No, no. So, 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 so no, no, no. It is, uh, uh, see, the number of K modes is, of course, uh, some conserved thing because uh, that is what we did. We counted this. So, the number of oscillators is conserved, but the number of quanta in each oscillator can be anything. You see, you go to oscillator number 1 <coughs> with omega 1, it can have n1 quanta there, and then the energy here is n1 plus half h cross omega 1. This guy can have n 2 h cut omega 2, right? So, of course, you are correct. I mean, the number of these oscillators is conserved. That is n, capital N. That is what we used in the Debye theory. But the number of modes I can excite here, that can be anything. And that is the number of particles. No, no, that happens for any bosonic system. That there is a probability to do that for any bosonic system. But uh, I mean, still, if you look at the total number of uh, quanta, uh, that's not conserved. Yeah. It's like different states. In each state, there are some particles. Yeah, yeah. And if you sum up the number, you will still have giant fluctuations, as I just showed. That's the because it is not enough to just define the average. You need to look at the fluctuations about the average, right? So, okay. somehow this yellow chalk runs out very quickly. <laughs> oh, yeah, in, inside the box, yes. Okay. So, now we will again consider a system where the particles are non-interacting, but we will additionally have a chemical potential. Okay. Good. So, now let me use a slightly different notation, curly E, because this is the grand canonical uh, partition function. So, we will again sum up over states, but instead of just one parameter inverse temperature, we will have another parameter, which is this number. Okay. Now, that is very easy. We can, we for a non-interacting thing, this is very easy. This is something like E 1 N 1 plus E 2 N 2 plus dot dot dot. And this is something like N 1 plus N 2 plus dot dot dot. Right? That is it. Right? Good. So, then we do that. We sum over N 1 N 2 everything. And uh, of course, all the n 1, n 2, n 3, they run from 0 to infinity, because these are bosons. Okay? Yeah. 
So then again by the usual trick of solving these things we get the following. Right, and this sum we can do easily, and then, yeah, let me not, yeah, okay, let's just write it in the denominator. Okay, so this is this uh, grand canonical partition function. So then, the important thing is again the log of this thing, exactly like log of z, right? That is the important thing and then this multiplication would become a summation when I take a log and then there is a log inside. This right. So, this is what we get good. So, now I leave it as an exercise for you again you can show straightforwardly that uh, expectation n j is given by uh, d log of the grand canonical thing. See this is very easy to remember right. In those cases we just had log of z here. Instead of that we have log of the grand canonical partition function here right. So, when you can again try to derive it it is uh, very easy to derive good. So, when we do that we get the following. this is the Bose Einstein distribution function right. Okay. So, now in those two cases, uh, those two cases were special cases of this right, where mu was 0 right. So, those two cases were special cases where mu was 0, because there was no explicit way we could enforce the number conservation and because we could not enforce the number conservation the associated Lagrange multiplier is simply 0 right. So, this is yeah okay, good. So, those, but in these cases uh, we will see that mu is uh, non 0 good. Okay. So, now we are considering a bunch of uh, bosons in a box here, because we want to understand B C and these just have kinetic energy right. So, the energy of each particle is uh, P square by 2 m. Right. So, the minimum energy state is uh, 0 if you wish right, because it is just kinetic energy right. So, now you should see one thing. So, okay, there is another way to write this E j min is 0. Okay. So, E j min is 0. So, then that actually leads to a very nice statement uh, for these kinds of systems that uh, mu is always uh, less than or equal to 0. Okay, mu is always less than or equal to 0. Why is that? Because okay, you can try to do this yourself. Suppose mu is okay, suppose E j is very close to 0 okay, and mu is a number greater than 0 and you are in the very low temperature limit. Then of course, uh, uh, if uh, this thing turns negative, uh, this exponential decreases towards 0, but there is a minus 1. Right, so, this entire thing becomes close to minus 1, but this is a number here. So, that can never turn negative. Right? So, the only way to avoid that is if this is your minimum energy condition that naturally enforces on you that mu is either equal to 0 or less than 0. It can be nothing else. Right? So, this is absolutely clean. Okay, good. So, let us remember that, because this is going to be important when we understand Bose Einstein condensation. So, let us box it. Okay. Good. So, now uh, it is actually in most test books it is uh, what they define when they study B C and since I am following Kirsten Huang I will stick to his notations. They define something called a fugacity. There is a certain advantage to doing that. So, this is just this quantity. Okay. So, this is called fugacity. Right. So, since mu is 0 or less than that, that automatically means, okay, what does it mean for this number z, this fugacity? So, I am saying that mu is in this range. What does it imply for z? 
one or less than one, but it constrains it even more. What is the interval which, in which it can lie in? Zero to one. Zero to one. Okay. So, hmm. so as I said, this is very important for understanding VC, and I'm just redefining the chemical potential in some way. Uh, and so, this is also going to be. Uh, let's mark it therefore. Uh, so, this is important to remember that this z can only lie in the interval 0 to 1. So, let us remember that, right? Good. So far, so good, right? Okay. So, now we are considering a free boson system. So, yeah, uh, somebody had a question? No. Okay, good. So, yeah, now we can just go ahead, right? So, suppose I have a level. Uh, which is characterized by a momentum p right because uh, these are non interacting particles right so it's i can characterize uh, it by momentum p these bosons so there's a there's something with a momentum p1 there's something with a momentum p2 and so on and so forth then in terms of z i can just write this entire distribution in terms of this variable right so let's just write it down uh, for once and uh, so, it is z times e to the minus beta e p and this is 1 minus z times e to the minus beta e p. Okay. This is the thing. This is just this equation written in terms of this variable and yeah, that is it. Okay. Good. Okay, so now of course uh, we know what to do. I mean, the first thing that we need to do is uh, we need to write an equation to determine the chemical potential, or alternatively, the fugacity, right? Because let's say the temperature is given to us, right? Because I know what is the temperature of the box. There's still one unknown here, this mu. So if I determine fugacity, I determine mu the chemical potential right so i need to write an equation to determine this guy right so uh, that i can do uh, okay so let's just do that so i'll use that part of the blackboard Okay, so then I use the usual trick of converting a sum over k into a sum over an integral and so on and so forth. Okay, and of course you can easily go from k to p by using the relation that p is h cut times k, right? So, so then you can just do all those transformations. So then, of course, the defining equation for mu is. Uh, what is the number density that I want in my system, right? Because that defines uh, what my chemical potential is, right? So then you can check the algebra later, but essentially this is what you get. So the integral is from 0 to infinity, again because the particles are living in continuum, okay? So z to the minus 1 e to the beta. Of course, these are free particles. So, I would write p square by 2 m here, right? These are free particles minus 1. Okay. Good. So, everybody is happy so far? Nobody is terribly unhappy, right? This is uh, what I get. And this equation should determine z, right? Good. Now, there are some complicated mathematical steps, which I can just skip. Uh, but <laughs> Let me just, uh, uh, yeah, let me just write it in a box here. Ultimately, these integrals have to be expressed in terms of uh, some functions which have a nice series representation. Okay, and uh, this is uh, explained in Kirsten Huang and other textbooks as well. So, uh, I mean, 
this is just uh, some tedious algebra, so I'm not sh showing it here. The main thing is the physics, which I'll actually come to. And uh, so, so there are functions like that. And of course, z is defined from 0 to 1, right? Important thing, z is defined from 0 to 1. Right? So, I actually forgot uh, <laughs> the name of these functions, but okay. What? Uh, maybe. So, are these the Riemann zeta functions? Okay, if you are saying so, then I believe you, but yeah, okay. Good. So, then uh, we have to express uh, everything in terms of these functions and they have nice series representations, right. Good. So, now, uh, so I will not show that, but uh, ultimately after some algebra, you can re-express this integral like this and I will explain what the symbols are like this. Okay, where this lambda is our old friend, it's the thermal de Broglie length. Okay, so let me just write lambda again. We had uh, written this many a times earlier. Good. So this is the answer. So we have to somehow massage this integral a bit so that it becomes obvious that it comes into this form. I mean, from here it's still not completely obvious, but there are some steps, but after you do those steps, you get this. Okay? Good. I mean, you can try reading up the steps in Erson and Huang. If you think it is complicated, you can ask me and then I can try to explain in the class. But if you understand it, well and good. Okay? So, good. So, right. Okay. Now comes a very crucial property. So, I said that the range of z is between 0 to 1. Okay? So, how does this function look between 0 to 1? So, first let us ask ourselves some simple question. So, is this function a bounded function if my z is between 0 to 1? Is this bounded? I mean, uh, I have given the function to you. What do you think? Is it bounded? There must be a yes or no answer. What? Good. It is bounded. Clearly, it is bounded because uh, I am working in the 0 to 1 range. Even if you stick 1 here, you can easily see that this is a convergent series. Okay? So, it is bounded. Good. Is it positive? What? Sorry, what? No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. For this 3 by 2 is bounded. Yeah, yeah. Correct, correct, correct. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Of course, I mean, yeah, yeah, you have to otherwise do a ratio test. That's correct. For 3 by 2, it's certainly bounded. So, you do the ratio test, put z equal to 1, do the ratio test, you can show that it's bounded. Good. So, this is bounded. Now, is the function positive? Good. It's always positive because each of the terms is positive. So, obviously, the thing is positive. Okay. Is the function, okay, so suppose I draw it, try to draw it. Do you think it's a monotonic function or a non monotonic function? Just look at the function. I mean, it's not hard to see. Is what? Yeah, it's monotonically increasing. Obviously, as I increase z, I mean, this function is bound to increase. Okay, so good. So we can just draw this function. I mean, okay, uh, this is slightly hard, but okay. At least I know that uh, I know the endpoint values, and I'll draw something. <laughs> so basically, z is defined from zero to one for us, right? That's always very important. And uh, yeah, so it, this function sort of looks like this, okay? And of course, uh, here it's as somebody said, it's the Riemann zeta function. So here the value is roughly, roughly 2.61 something something something, roughly, okay? So this is the maximum in this thing, and that's what it goes to. Good. The six one two something something, I don't remember the. Yeah. Yeah. But there are more digits after that, right? Yeah. So, 
right okay now comes an interesting thing so now let's uh, look at this thing so this is n right this is just the average number density this is n so n is equal to g 3 by 2 to the power z uh, lambda q right good and the upper bound of this quantity the upper bound of this quantity is everybody agrees with me right this is the upper bound of this quantity so this is roughly equal to let's just write it down so now notice the amazing thing this is n right some fixed number i have given you a system and i have given you number density of boson some fixed number so it's some number whatever that number is it's a fixed number and this is some expression i have to calculate it's some complicated expression but that expression has an upper bound but look at the upper bound now look at this up and bound do you see any problem <coughs> with this side and that side what so this is a fixed number but look at this do you see any problem okay so, but what is the problem what do you mean n is fixed i have given you n n is the property of how many rubidium atoms i throw in the box right no 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 but that's just an upper bound right i mean yeah, yeah. n is also a density right right and even if no no but no no even if n were to be an integer this is just an upper bound the upper bound may be a non integer i mean even more if you think about it right Th that's not the answer think carefully n is a fixed number given to you by your setup but look at this number i mean the problem should be clear to you one one person one person uh, anybody brave or why why should n be 0 at t equal to 0 no no so is there any problem with the formula what is the problem no, no that is not the problem uh, well, you are saying almost the right thing, but you are saying it in a very circular manner. If you sat in a mathematics exam and you wrote this, you would get zero. So this inequality is violated. That's the short answer. This inequality is violated below a certain temperature because this left hand side stays fixed with temperature, but this right hand side keeps decreasing with temperature. So this inequality has to be violated. There is no way that this inequality can survive, right? Correct? Is that point clear to everybody? And so what is the temperature at which this inequality is violated? So we will just write that. I mean that is just when this n equals this thing and below that temperature of course it is violated. So let us just write that. And then I will explain what happens below this temperature. So and that magical temperature is the Bose-Einstein condensation temperature. And that, therefore, just depends on the density and mass and all these other parameters. Also, in my notation, this small v is again as I had defined earlier, capital V by n. Okay. Two by three. Yeah, because I have to. Okay. Good. So, how can we save ourselves? So, if I literally stick to this formula and I go to a temperature below Tc, below this Tc, then my right hand side is bound to be smaller than my left hand side. But there is an equality here. So, what are we missing? What is the physics we are missing? The physics that we are missing can be argued very simply if we directly go to zero temperature. It can be argued very simply and then we just extend it to finite temperature. See, this is a bosonic system. So there is nothing called Pauli exclusion here, right? In fact, bosons like to be with each other somehow. Okay, right. So again, let us say there are these energy levels, right? There is some minimum energy level which we denoted by zero. So suppose I am at zero temperature, 
Then at zero temperature, I don't need to worry about the entropy. The only thing I need to minimize is energy. What do you think is the ground state of this problem? I have n bosons given to you. What do you think is the ground state? Yeah, all would just occupy here because there's nothing to prevent them from doing that, right? I mean, of course, if they were fermions, I could not have done that, right? That's impossible, right? Good. So I know that at t equal to zero, all the bosons are in the k equal to zero state. Is that point clear? Is that point clear? Good. Now let's look at uh, ah, where did I? Anyway, so yeah, <laughs> we had something like the when we move from the summation of k to an integration over k, we had uh, something like this, which is, which was effectively counting the number of states. Uh, in a shell between k to k plus uh, dk, right? Now see the thing. So the weight associated to a tiny shell around k equal to 0 is what? Look at this. What is the weight? So it's 0, right? It's 0 because it's uh, multiplied by k squared. So it's precisely 0, right? Of course, for all ordinary situations, it works. But if there is a macroscopic occupation at some level, I cannot just choose to ignore that level in my integration, right? So I have to put that information by hand, if you wish, right? Because if I write this integral, the measure of the integral is 0, around k equal to 0. So there is no way I can just represent this kind of a thing by writing an integral. That's why it was failing below a certain temperature, right? So then I need to write an extra piece here. Okay. And that extra piece is also very easy to guess. So that extra piece just comes from here. It's the occupation of the uh, epsilon equal to 0 level. So I just put epsilon equal to 0 here, right? Then I get whatever I get and I just add it to that, right? So is that clear? So then the whole thing is, has to have this kind of a thing, this kind of a thing. Now you see, why didn't you have to worry about this term when t was above tc? When t was above tc, you can actually show, just by solving this equation, you can figure out z, you can show that z is not yet tending to 1. If z does not tend to 1, and of course z can tend to 1 only from below, because of that restriction. Where was it? Oh, there. z can only tend to 1 from below. It can only approach 1 from below. So if z is not tending to 1, this number is some finite number, agreed? And it's being divided by a very big number. So then I can ignore it. But what happens if z approaches 1? Then it's not so clear, right? In fact, this entire number can itself become finite, right? And that's exactly what happens below the Bose-Einstein condensation temperature. And that's the only way in which this relation can make any sense because of course it cannot happen that below tc some of the particles are lost that's impossible right i mean if there were particles to start at whatever temperature you had of course if you cool the system down those particles are still there there is no way that this relation can be violated so this thing saves us right good so uh, let me take five or six more minutes just to complete this story because i just don't want to leave it at this stage Okay, so everybody is with me so far? Good. So we do this. So then see it's very easy. If you go below TC, what is the macroscopic occupation? Well, it's very simple. Below TC, this guy has reached its maximum contribution, right? Below TC, this guy has reached its maximum contribution. So let me just erase that part and just summarize the results for you. So just from that equation, the top equation, which has both this term, which has both this term and this term, and now this term, which is just this guy, 
has reached its maximum value, right? So then we can just use that and we can figure out how much density is in the uh, k equal to 0 state, right? Let's call that by symbol n naught because that's the lowest energy and that's simply n minus this. Everybody is happy? This is the only way that relation can be true. There's no other way that relation can be true, right? And of course, this is roughly n minus 2.612 dot 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 2 pi n k b t by x square 3 by 2, right? So using this, so this is n naught. Using this, we can easily see that n naught of t is just n times 1 minus t by t c 3 by 2. That is it. Okay? So, you just use the expression of T c which we got from there and you just massage this equation a bit and you will get this. That is it. So, if we plot, if we plot the occupation of n naught, so sorry, the average number density in the 0th level, the ground state level divided by the total density of particles in the system, then this is 1, this is 0 this is t, then how should the graph look like? What do you think? What should I draw? I have marked all the important things for you. What happens if I am coming like this? Where should my graph start from? No, no, from this. I am coming from high temperature. From high temperature. See, at high temperature, as I proved to you, this thing goes to 0 because this is a finite number. What? Yeah. So, at high temperature it is 0, precisely 0 and then when you cross T c, which is that boxed expression, then this number becomes finite, right? This number density becomes finite <coughs> and it asymptotically reaches 1 like this and basically the relation is this. Okay? Good. Okay. Second thing, how do you think the fugacity looks like? So, remember the fugacity can only vary between 0 and 1. So, again I put 0 and 1 here and this is T c and this is T. So, this is uh, the magical thing. So, yeah. What do you think the fugacity does? What happens above T c and below T c? Well, if you are at very high temperature, you can show that the fugacity will tend to 0. So, something like that would happen. It will keep decreasing here. What happens here? See, uh, when T becomes less than T c, this number has to diverge, this number. So, what is the only way in which this number can diverge? Yeah. So, <laughs> below T c, Z becomes fixed at 1 and then above T c it does something like this. That is it. This is the behavior and that is it. Okay? Good. So, this is the explanation of the Bose-Einstein condensation. Okay? Uh, right. So, there is one thing I would like to comment on here before leaving you for today is that uh, I mean of course, in a system of bosons typically even if uh, they are weak, there are always some interactions between the bosons, right? So, you can ask what does interactions do? Does it change anything? Of course, then what happens is, uh, well, many things change, but one of the important things which change is the following. See, here the energy dispersion was like p square, right? Because these were free particles. Now, when you put in interactions, you will notice that uh, again there will be gapless excitations uh, as a function of p, but they won't go as p square. They won't go as p square. In fact, uh, they would go linearly in p. Okay, so that is the first thing which interactions does. And these modes in these uh, systems are also called phonons. Okay, so these are again like some long wavelength density fluctuations. Okay, so, the moment you put in interactions, 
immediately this p square changes from uh, changes to p and these are essentially like sound waves okay so that's again one thing which uh, changes but okay i mean even at this level even with non interacting particles you can already see why something like a bose einstein condensation can occur generically if you keep lowering the temperature right good so this was uh, something that i wanted to tell you at least for because i showed you this nice picture in the morning and this analysis is not very complicated and it gives you nicely this kind of a critical temperature above which there is a smooth increase in this n not and you can even predict how this increases right so this is a very nice exercise uh, to do so as i say i mean there are some steps which i skipped for example how did i go from here to here but you can just check huang and if there is some confusion you can ask me okay but uh, otherwise i think the physical thing is all very clear why it's happening it's it's all very clear right so and then i pointed out the difference when you the moment you put in some interactions right so in fact when you put in some interactions not only are there these linearly dispersing modes there are some things called roton excitations etc and then you go to even higher momentum and then this thing changes to p square which is particle like but uh, let's not go into that because that will take us beyond the uh, scope of this lecture we, i just mentioned it so that at least you know what's the main difference okay good so that's where i would like to stop and if you have any questions you can ask me now well it does not follow completely straightforwardly but you can show that there is some kind of a bose einstein condensation yeah in fact if you yeah uh, in fact uh, when you put in interactions uh, you can show that uh, okay this is getting slightly technical but uh, you remember as was said by pk and also some other lecturers normally phase transitions are associated with some order parameter so in this system you cannot define in some sense a very kosher order parameter if these are non interacting uh, objects but with interactions you can actually show that there is a very interesting order parameter and it is very subtle and people took a long time to realize it uh, below tc there is something called off diagonal long range order uh, i won't explain it in the class but uh, it's it's very unlike most of the other long range orders that you have seen and uh, that's very subtle and that happens because of interaction so i mean uh, there is some complication but but there is some sort of a transition after which there is a macroscopic occupation of the low lying that statement is true but there is something also much more subtle happening which people took a long time to realize also there is something which i can mention in short which you will appreciate even if i don't go deep into the physics you must have heard that superfluids can flow through small pipes etc etc and uh, if you don't push them above a critical velocity they keep flowing that kind of a thing requires the presence of interactions that will never happen in the absence of interactions this thing even below tc is not a superfluid that's the short answer this is a bose einstein condensate but but a bose einstein condensate is not equal to a superfluid a superfluid is a state of matter which has uh, broken symmetry and uh, uh, basically you need interactions to get this you cannot get it in a free theory like this and uh, yeah i mean let me not say more <laughs> okay what else anything else right now okay good then we can all happily leave the lecture room